A very good evening to everyone. I'm Hamza Dwani Devdas, the moderator of today's session. It's really gloomy and pouring outside. I'm, hope, I'm hoping the same at your doorstep as well. So we are here to comfort you with two outstanding books to talk about it and to get to know more about it. I'm extremely pleased to welcome all of you to yet another session of Pick a Books, The Flip Side webinar series. We are now live on Facebook and LinkedIn. We have individuals joining in from many different countries and areas. Let's give it another couple of minutes to see whether people are joining in and commenting. Until then, let me first take you to this Pick a Book. Um, when we start having a look at the introduction about Pick a Book, it's very simple. Just like Pick a Book encourages the reading habit by getting all participants to select a book, read and research on it thoroughly and present a summary, which also sharpen his or her public speaking skills, communication and presentation skills. By doing this, Pick a Book not only inculcates the habit of reading, also help to impart a wealth of knowledge. Currently, Pick a Book has marked its inspiring presence in four countries, namely Sri Lanka, India, the United Kingdom, and Singapore. Pick a Book is counting to spread its wings across the whole globe. Having said that, I'm very warmly welcoming the two presenters. Before that, let me quickly take you through the two outstanding books that we are going to look at it. The first book which we are going to look is Man's Search for Meaning by Victor E. Frankl. Victor E. Frankl's 1946 book Man's Search for Meaning chronicles his experiences as a Nazi concentration camp prisoner during World War II, as well as outlining his psychophytic method, which all involves defining a positive purpose in life and then immersively visualizing that end. And the second book that we are going to look at it is Please, Please Look, for Mom, Look After Mom by Sin Kang Siuk. Please Look After Mom tells you the story of a family searching for their missing mother. When the mother, who has spent her entire life devoted to housekeeping and farming, vanishes, the family says how little they knew about her. Uh, when I talk about the first presenter, he's very... Uh, he's He's a very interesting person. Uh, he's Mr. Mas Savanga. He is currently heading the global training and development function at Attune. He has over 18 years of experience in human resources and talent management. Mas is an avid sportsman, a long list distance runner, and has represented the Arabian Gulf in rugby union. He's also, on MB uh, he's also an MBA lecturer he spends most of his time working with professionals on his co life coaching and skill development. Welcome, Amaz, to the show. Thank you How so you much. Feeling? A pleasure to be here. How are you feeling? Brilliant, brilliant. It's such a pleasure to be here uh, in front of all uh, our audience as well and sharing insights from this book. So I'm very excited. Thank you so much for the invitation to be a part of this. Thank you. We are very pleased to welcome you, Mas. And then the next presenter is Ms. Inoka Koritwako. She is working as a business development manager at Ceylon Eco Spices Private Limited, following a postgraduate diploma in marketing at SLIM and a chartered qualification in human resources management at CIPM. Her interests are photography, traveling, reading, and music. Her favorite quote is, the future belongs to those who believe in their dreams. Welcome, uh, Inoka. How are you? Hi, Hamsu. Uh, I'm feeling glad and I'm so excited and looking forward to have a, a, a good program tonight. <laughs> All right. Um, so, ladies and let gentlemen, let's go straight into the session. First of all, we are going to be looking at the book Man's Search for Meaning. Mas, what, what does the title Man's Search for Meaning signify? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, so if I'm just to, if you just to recap and talk about the significance of the title. So this was a book I actually stumbled upon by chance. Um, I was in Munich on work and I'm a big World War II buff and I always wanted to go and visit these concentration camps and, and stuff like that. So one afternoon I had, um, you know, the, the, the day off uh, and then I went into a camp called Dachau, which was 
amazing because it's everything I read about in books and, and watch documentaries and stuff like that. So when I was trying to leave uh, the camp at the end of it, I wanted to leave with a fridge magnet just to symbolize, okay, I've been here and uh, something to remind me of the camp. But then at the gift shop, the lady said, listen, instead of buying a fridge magnet, why don't you pick up this book? And I'm like, what is this book all about? And she said, this is Man's Search for Meaning. It is a life-changing book and not your typical Holocaust sort of biography of someone who's lived in the camp, but this actually inspires people to find their own meaning in life and how you can actually find meaning in suffering. Uh, because this particular author, Victor Franklin, um, who authored this book, talks about how he managed to survive uh, Auschwitz, which was one of the most um, difficult camps to be in during World War II, and how he managed to make it out alive after a number of years, and how he found meaning in his suffering. So the title alone is quite um, amazing because when you actually go to one of those camps, you don't expect anyone to come out alive. And forget coming out alive to find meaning in that circumstance. And Victor Franklin found meaning and it is a book that I have read and something that I always look to whenever times are difficult or challenging, where I try to find my own meaning in, in life. So that is why the title is so important to me as well. Hope that answered your question, Hamza. That's really interesting. You went to buy a fridge magnet and then end of the day you bought a book. And I'm really sure as an avid reader, I'm really into books and I'm hope and, and I really can feel how you feel about that book and you really have a story, ground story about the book. Thank you for that answer. And then let's move on to the next uh, presenter. Inoka, can you tell a bit about the book and the author? Uh, yes, actually, uh, first of all, I'll speak about the author. The author is uh, one of the uh, Korean writers. She's uh, Kion Suk Shin. And she's a person, uh, she was born in 1963, and uh, she was in Seoul uh, up to her age 16. And then she moved to, uh, the, when, the, uh, when she moved to uh, uh, the, I mean, to the city uh, to uh, polish her, uh, I mean, writing skills, where in the morning hours she used to work and in the evening she used to study. So that's how uh, she had come across this uh, beautiful journey of literary. And in 1985, she was, uh, she made her uh, lit uh, literary debut in, uh, with her book, uh, Winter's Fable, for which uh, she was ena enabled to win the uh, New Authors Prize. And when it come to this book, Please Look After Mom, uh, it's, I think, a big milestone in all the, all the women writers because, uh, because of this book in 2012, uh, she was able to win the Man Asian Literary Prize, which is the first time uh, a woman uh, was won that uh, award. And uh, she was the first Korean, of course. And then uh, now she's living, she lives in uh, both USA and uh, South Korea because she's a visiting lecturer uh, in one of the USA universities. So when it comes to the book, the please look after mom, I thought I will start the uh, start about the big uh, book uh, with a quote of quote from the book. It says uh, how unfair it is that all she did was sacrifice everything for us. And she wasn't understood by anyone. So that's a typical mother. So the whole story is based on this lady Park Sonyo, who was uh, separated from her husband at the Seoul subway, subway station uh, when she and her uh, husband went to see uh, their children in Seoul. And thereafter, uh, her husband and her children, how they were desperate to find her and how they think about uh, her mother, because everyone know, everyone thinks that uh, we know everything about the people around us, but at the end of the day, that's not the truth. So that's all about, that's about the book. So we can discuss other things uh, when we are move on with the program. <laughs> yes, sure, Inoka, that's really emotional and I can uh, literally relate it to my own life, right? We, we don't uh, cherish the things which is around us or the people around us the moment then when we lose them or when we are apart from them we really cherish or miss them right so i'm really looking forward to talk more about the book but before that let's move on to the other book 
Mas, if you can briefly describe Dr. Victor Frankl's daily life in Nazi concentration camp, and what do you think uh, was his mental state during? Sure. Thanks for for the question. So, it, it's probably the most horrendous thing that you you can ever imagine, because what happens is when you enter the camp and there were a number of different prisoners who were actually um, herded into the camp from communists to Jews to prisoners of war, a number of different people. And once you actually made it into the camp, if you were fit enough to work, you were dehumanized, which meant that you, your hair was shaved off, all your worldly possessions were taken away from you. You were, you were given a barcode, which was, um, uh, which was um, uh, lodged into your skin. And you were basically meant not to feel like a human, right? Totally dehumanized. So like a cattle, you know, would have been branded, um, you know, with, with, a, with a number, serial number. That's all you were. You didn't have a name. You didn't have uh, appearance. You didn't have any worldly positions. All you had was a number which depicted who you were, a prisoner of war. And in terms of mentality, a lot of people became very numb to the situation because in their wildest dreams, they would have never imagined being in a situation where everything has been taken away from you, from your family, from your possessions, to everything. You are now sharing a bunk with about five people. And these are very small bunks, you know, a couple of feet big. And things that you would never imagine you would ever encounter, now you are living it. So many people were very numb to it. Dr. Wittler Franklin was very surprised and he never thought that he did certain things that he would of ever envision him ever of doing. Like, for example, I mean, if you don't brush your teeth for a couple of days, you think that is bad. But now you never get to brush your teeth ever. You're now sharing a bunk with five people. You have now a set of pajamas, which you wear for years and years. Um, and, and from a mental point of view, in the beginning, you are very um, open to all everything that's happening around you. But after some time, you develop apathy, which means you just don't find this as a surprise anymore. Because what happened, in Victor, uh, Dr. Victor Franklin describes is there were other prisoners who were brought into the camp and they were also tortured and put under a lot of different, um, uh, you know, um, uh, very horrendous situations. But after a while, you develop apathy, which means you don't feel anything. You watch them, you see them suffering, you see families going into gas chambers, but you feel nothing because now you're conditioned to believe that is your new normal. So from a mental state, you are at your lowest where you don't even feel like a human. And why this book is so uh, touched me so much is because in spite of all this, still there are a few who manage to salvage some bits of humanity to be able to survive through these difficult ordeals and make it out alive. And if you can withstand this, anything in your life sounds, you know, very, uh, very normal. I mean, we all have different challenges. You know, we find it difficult to find jobs, make money. Uh, you know, we have our personal battles, our challenges with our, you know, in our personal life. But if you can withstand something like this, everything else sounds so elementary. And, and it's all putting things into perspective. So that is why this book is so impactful and why it touched me so much. So the mental state is you're, you're really brought down to your knees. Life takes you down to your knees and, and, it, and it really questions you, can you respond to this? And Dr. Wickler Franklin was one of the few who did respond to this. And I'll probably touch upon this a little later, but um, that is the mental state and what Victor Franklin was exposed to on a daily basis. Which is very true, um, as I totally agree on it. Now we are in that era at some point, right? We are into the new normal and we were talking about it also by that. Uh, so we are just getting into it and we are getting really into it. And the normal days, the prior in scenarios were like really looking uh, new to us. And I can really relate to it. And I it's really um, uh, very true. But And we talk about this book more and moving on to the next presenter. Inoka, if, is there any particular reason to choose this book out of the other books you have read? Is there any uh, particular yes. incident? Yeah, yes, Hamsu. Actually, uh, now uh, I think this COVID-19 pandemic has taught us so very, very big lessons in our lives. So when it comes to this book, after I read the book, I mean, it uh, in a it says in a different way that uh, 
how a neg a very small negligence uh, can cause a life a lasting guilt in our heart especially when it comes to someone who is really important to us and inside we inside our heart that we know that uh, we have taken that person for granted so the whole book is about the uh, when we talk about Park Sonyo's husband and her children they were all i mean they were all suffering because they couldn't do much for her uh, mother or her or uh, Park Sonyo's husband to her uh, to his uh, wife so it clearly says that they were all feeling guilty in their hearts so the main reason i chose this uh, chose this book is that i really wanted to give an piece of i mean not an advice just a moment to think for all our uh, audience today so and and also uh, when you read the book uh, it clearly says that uh, the importance of our relationships i mean uh, i know that we all are very busy people and we have our commitments and all but at the same time, uh, we forget that we have a family and we have a wife at home and we have children. And what we are doing is that uh, we are always taking people for granted whom re whom uh, who are really uh, I mean important to us. So, I mean that's natural because we all are human beings. But we can reduce that. We can think about our families and our siblings uh, and and people around us in a different way and at the same time uh, this there's a uh, uh, one at the end of the book there's a very important thing so moving on I will explain that so that's the main reason that I chose this book today to give insight that uh, I mean what what is mother's unconditional love for her family and the children and the sacrifices she made for the betterment of her family and at the same time uh, i mean she also needs someone to talk about and for a, just think about just think about it are we are we having any time to discuss with her what's happening around us and how she feels and all those things i don't think so because uh, when it comes to our asian culture the mother is the main person we all take for granted. So, over to you, Hamsu. <laughs> Thank you, Inoka. And I again and again can relate. And I see a similarity in these two books that we are forgetting the moment, cherishing the moment until we get onto a situation where we don't have that moment again or the people with us anymore. And uh, I really want to look uh, look forward to the answer, like the particular reason that you have chosen at the end. Uh, let's move on to the other book. Uh, Mas, what are the lessons this book has taught you from a personal perspective? Sure, that's a great question again. So let me quote something from the book. And this is one of my favorite quotes from Man's Search for Meaning. And it says that everything can be taken away from a man, but one last thing the last of a human freedoms to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances to choose one's way. So what this basically means is, I mean, even in a concentration camp, everything was taken away from all the prisoners. You're stripped off your identity, basically. But there's one thing that nobody can take away from you, and that is your will, your attitude in any given situation. Now, we were all doing, we were all in it together, right, during COVID last year. And when I spoke to a bunch of people, um, there were two different viewpoints. One set of people said, listen, it's the worst year I've ever had. Uh, I really don't know what's going to happen. I'm struggling through this. I'm like a deer stuck in the headlight. And another group of people said, listen, it's a very challenging time. But we look at it in the sense that it really gives us an opportunity to reconnect with our families, to find alternative sources of income, to learn new skills, to challenge ourselves. And it's the same situation, but the perspective is totally different. So what this book has taught me is, irrespective of your challenges, irrespective of whatever's happening in your life, you might seem as though your world is crashing down upon you, but you have a choice of how you want to respond. Either you can be that deer caught in the headlights, not doing anything, waiting, the whole, waiting for the whole world to change, or you can be like, listen, I am responsible for my own future, and I'm going to find a way through this or out of this. 
And I think this is the biggest lesson that I got from the book because life and everyone else can take so many things away from you, but it cannot take away your own attitude, how, how you wish to respond to a situation. And I think that has really helped me because whenever there are things that happen in my life that are very difficult, challenging, whenever life gets me to my knees, I always think either I can stay down on the mat or I can find a way to respond to that situation. And, and that is the biggest lesson I got from the book, uh, Hansu. I hope that answered your question. Very, very um, the thing is shuts down. We have ourselves and it, the courage, willpower, which is very true. And we are dealing with it, right, at the current si situation as well. Uh, moving on to the next presenter, Inoka, can you explain the character in the book and how they relate? to our day-to-day -day life? Uh, that's a good question, actually. Because even though this is a fiction, the Park Sonyo or her husband or his uh, or her uh, elder son, uh, Hyun Chol or Chi Hon or her other daughter, I think all these people are, live within us. I mean, uh, Miss Shin is speak about uh, speak about all of us because it represents us actually so for an example i will take like this because uh, there's a moment that uh, her in the book it says uh, her eldest son wanted her certificates to be delivered to uh seol but uh, his father couldn't do that so at the middle of the night uh, uh there was a knock on his uh, office door because he was used to uh, stay in that uh, office at that time. So when he opened the door, it was his mother. And he was uh, and uh, he was shocked because at that time he was wondering because she has never come to see all before. So she was telling that uh, this is the first thing you wanted. Uh, you want you asked me to do. How can I uh, forget it? I have to do that. And at the same time, she was uh, telling uh, telling her, her son that this is not the first thing that uh, you I did because of you. Uh, he being the first son, uh, so I mean, he's the one who brought so many happiness to her at the first time. At first time, at first. So and at, and also when when it comes to a uh, uh, Park Sonyo's daughters, and the because it says that Park Sonia was uh, afraid that her eldest, uh, youngest daughter was traveling all, all, all over the world. And she tells her that uh, don't take planes, don't, uh, don't go in planes like that. And whenever she wants to uh, go like that, uh, her mother is asking, why are you going? Then all she said was like, because I have to go, mother. She's not giving any reason. She just say that because I have to go, so I'm going. And at the same time, uh, there was uh, uh, the book says about uh, Park Sonia's other daughter, and where uh, Park Sonia has kept so many hopes about her, but at the end, uh, she was becoming a uh, uh, her, she was becoming a mother with three children where she has forgot all her dreams and she was sacrificing everything for her children, which Park Sonia doesn't like. And she was, I mean, she got angry with her also when she was coming from USA to uh, settle in Seoul. And and Bukit says said that uh, she was, I mean, she felt sad, but she couldn't do anything because she has so many hopes about her daughter. And also, uh, I mean, uh, there were some instances about with her husband also, and uh, he was. I mean, uh, there were moments that uh, he. Uh, uh, no, I no. Let me put it this way: there were some times that she always tells him that, uh, "Why are you going so fast? I can't catch you. Just walk slowly." But he didn't do that. He always go very, very fast, and um, at the end, he was just uh, waiting for her to follow him. That's it, and she he never used to uh, go with her, and she even used she even used to tell him that also. I don't ask you to hold my hand and go with me. Just go in the go the way I also can follow you. That's what I mean. Those kind of those kind of things are happening in our day to day life, and when it comes to uh, I mean, 
uh, the book says that uh, when she, when her daughters and sons uh, came from Seoul, she used to go to the market and stock meat and toothpaste and uh, toothbrushes and think that how how uh, sh how a mother could be thoughtful. And at the same time, because I being a, uh, with a family of uh, seven girls, I know how my mother also prepare whenever my elder sisters and her and their children comes and how she used to get the best things and the sweets or uh, biscuits for the my nieces and nephews so that's a typical mother and also uh, uh, I mean there were so many moments like that because uh, then no I will no I will tell this one uh, at one time uh, no one knows that uh, she was going through what she is going through and she was having constant headaches but uh, no one used to bother about it but at one time one of her daughters uh, uh, taking her to the doctors and she got a shock of her life when the doctor said that she had a stroke nobody knows about it nobody knows about it but that's the reason she's getting constant headaches and we all know that whenever our parents get sick they don't they don't want to go to the doctors because the main reason is the main reason is for that because doctor says her to rest which she don't want to do she she don't want to take rest and she want to do everything for her kids and her husband and everything so i think uh, uh machine is speak about the real time characters even though it's a fiction <laughs> That's it, uh, Hamsu. Exactly. Now, uh, when I was a young girl, I used to tell my mom, why are you sacrificing? And you're with seven girls. I can imagine I had two brothers. And then I always tell her, no, don't, don't. Now you need to have your own life. When I became a mother, I can realize how motherhood, taking, a, taking care of your ch child, or your baby is very important than uh, own life or but it's the truth i seriously and we are all one point uh, stubborn uh, child and that one point will become a father or a, mother or a brother i mean we all can relate to it and i can feel you know moving on to the next question mas uh talks about a concept called logotherapy uh what does it mean could you take us through it? Sure. So logotherapy basically is a concept that is used very commonly now in the field of psychology. But what is interesting is it was actually developed by Dr. Victor Franklin. Um, so what he says is it is finding meaning in suffering. So every minute, every hour, every day, we might have some sort of suffering. But how do we find meaning in it? Because when we find meaning in our suffering, it no longer sees it, it ceases to be suffering at all. Now, now for his case, now when he was in the concentration camp, now he always envisioned that at the end of the at the end of the whole ordeal, he'll eventually get to see his wife. Now his wife was taken into the concentration camp with him, but they were separated. And only later on they found out that she was executed in the gas chamber while he survived. But he always had her thought in his mind, saying, Listen. I need to make this true because I don't want my wife to be alone. And that was, even though he went through very arduous suffering and a number of different challenges, the thought of his wife being at the end of the, uh, the whole ordeal made him uh, go through every single day with that hope. Now, what logotherapy talks about is in every single day, every single hour, life will challenge us. Life will challenge us and tell us, okay, this is what I'm. This is what life is all about. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be hard. But how do you, as a human, respond to life, and how do you find meaning in that suffering? And for the longest time, I didn't really understand logotherapy, until I actually read another book, uh, which sort of brought this into a better light. Now there was this lady once, who her husband had died recently, and she was alone, and she was taking care of her son. Now, her son had Down syndrome and going through a number of different complications as well. Now, the lady couldn't work because she needed to be with her son. And every day was a struggle because, you know, she didn't have much of a life, right? She couldn't work. 
she found it very difficult to put food for the table. She had to take care of her son and she didn't have a lot of support. And many times she contemplated suicide, right? Until the day she found out why, what she found that there was meaning in her suffering because she said, okay, fine, life, maybe not about me. Maybe my life is about finding, making sure my son has some sort of future ahead of him. And she found meaning in her suffering saying, it's not about me. It's about my son. And I need to live my life because it's not about me. I need to ensure that my son has a good chance in this life. And she found meaning in her suffering. So that is what logotherapy talks about. Every single challenge that comes uh, your way, it's very difficult to deal with it sometimes. But if you find meaning in that suffering, then you will actually find a way through that suffering and find your way out. Now, even right now, right, COVID-19, it's very difficult for a lot of people. But if you want to make it out alive for your family, for your kids, you know, you want to contribute more to humanity, that is going to get you to the finish line. When you put yourself aside and find meaning in your suffering. And that is what logotherapy talks about. So even from a psychologist's point of view, if anybody, you know, talks about, listen, I'm going through all these different trials and tribulations in life. What the psychologist will try to do is find meaning in that so that you can serve a cause greater than yourself. And that is what the whole concept of logotherapy is all about. Hope that made a bit of sense, uh, guys. It did. It did, Mark, actually. Uh, and it's a good uh, understanding as well. Like you find a meaning in the struggle that we really need to overcome. And we have no choice without uh, overcoming. And we are currently being an example overall. Uh, it's a pandemic and COVID. There are so many difficult situations and every day there's some sort of stressful information or people talking about negativity and but we are trying to overcome by being into this new normal that we all talk about and we are finding meaning out of it as well and i can seriously relate to the era that um uh, then, uh moving on to the next question you know what makes you to say that um, say that we hardly understand a mother wife and what she is going through and what really makes her feel happy yes actually uh, nowadays we are talking about in all the forums about women's rights or feminism or everything but i have a the i have a question are we really uh, giving any attempt to understand what a mother is going through and how she feels about certain things. I don't think so. It's it's only the words, not the actions. That's the I know it's it's that's a big truth. <laughs> so when it comes to this book, uh, there are so many things uh, uh, Miss she has described the uh, video. The one typical, I will tell you uh, one typical uh, example from the book uh, where it says that uh, one day uh, Park Sonia is going to the town and where she met uh, the uh, butcher's wife and she calls her and she invited her to uh, come and uh, have some uh, seaweed soup with her. So Park Sonia is asking from her, uh, what's the special occasion? Then she's telling that, uh, you no, know, my husband is the one who made this. So when Park Sonia goes home and uh, she was telling her husband, uh, it wasn't particularly tasty, but for the first time, I was envious about Butcher's wife. So because uh, this part was uh, actually uh, comes, uh, comes in the book when uh, Park Sonia's uh, husband was thinking about her after her disappearance. So he was thinking that, have I ever given a glass of water to my husband to my wife no he has he had never ever done that and at the same time uh, uh when the when park sonia was disappeared uh, her uh, her youngest daughter was uh, calling uh, park sonia's uh, husband and asking about him so then he was telling that uh, he had some issues and he was sick and everything and so at the same time, he was telling that, uh, I mean, when I was going through all these illnesses, she also must have gone through all those. But 
none of us uh, understanding her at that time all came after all came to their mind when they uh, lost her so and at the same time there was uh, one incident also when it comes to her uh, children uh, at one time uh, no i will tell this i think this will uh, make good sense uh, after park sonyo's uh, disappearance uh, her her husband stayed uh, some time with her uh, eldest son and then came back to her home their home uh, then there was a lady and he was uh, she was asking about where's uh, park sonyo auntie then he got shocked and he was wondering uh, how she uh, knows my wife then she was telling that uh, auntie was uh, contributing some money to the to an orphanage uh, every month and or, and she goes to the orphanage and cleaned everything and look after the kids and doing everything and all she asked was one thing that thing is uh, park sonyo's uh, eldest daughter was a writer and park sonyo can't write or uh, read anything so all she was asking from the owner of that uh, orphanage was to read her the book her daughter was written can you imagine the shock the husband gets i mean he was thinking why the hell she was not telling this to me i would have done and at the same time he was thinking if she really asked how will i do that for her i don't think so i don't think that he will also do that so that's why I, that's why the author gives an insight that uh, even though that we think that we know everything about our mother and we know everything about our wife and everything and something like that but that's not true i mean we we think that we know everything but the understanding part it hardly happens that's very i mean that's a very uh, sad factor but that's a truth so that's why i'm studying that uh, the, <laughs> the question you asked i think i have answered you hey <laughs> mota the truth uh, we always go and in why don't you tell me why don't you tell me but whether we are making them whether they are whether we are giving that comfort for them to come and talk to us whether we are whether they are feeling okay to come and open up and say things that they are really missing uh, is what that we really need to think upon uh, thank you so much that answer you know um moving on uh, to the next uh, question Um, were prisoners at concentration camps able to rebuild their lives after they were liberated after the war, or did you did they feel? How did they feel? Sure. So ideally, I mean, end of the war, a lot of concentration camps were liberated by the Allied forces, and you think life is going to go back to normal, right? Well, for a lot of the prisoners that Dr. Victor Franklin talks about, it didn't go back to normal. because what happened is when they left the camps and you know um i think the camp that he was in was liberated by uh, the russians so everyone thought okay life is going to be- go back to normal people are going to you know see what horrendous things that happened to us feel sorry for us but it didn't happen that way because the whole of europe was bombarded and everybody were now trying to rebuild their lives so they didn't have time to look at these prisoners and say listen we're going to give you special attention because you guys have been suffering for a number of years no because they were looking to rebuild their lives as well so these prisoners started walking across europe trying to go back to their homes looking for their family and guess what a lot of the family weren't alive they went back to their hometowns and their villages looking for their parents for their loved ones and the whole village wasn't there and then now they were thinking okay was it better to be in a concentration camp because when i come out and expecting a whole different world a liberated world I can't find anything that I knew before. And that too made things a whole lot different to what they expected to be liberated. So holistically when you think about the whole ordeal it's from the time Dr. Victor Franklin and all his colleagues went into these camps they didn't find much um relief at the end of it as well. And for them life didn't get much better. But it took a number of years decades sometimes for them to find some sort of normalcy at the end of it but again he goes back to his logotherapy okay how do i use this opportunity or how do how do i use my situation 
to find meaning in my life, to actually build myself for the next challenge that's going to come in my life. Because very often, right, I mean, if you think about it, in our lives, we tend not to put ourselves to difficult situations. But what happens is when we do encounter a difficult situation, we don't know exactly how to respond. Now, personally, for me, I'm somebody who runs ultra marathons, right? I've done 50 kilometers in a day, a lot of uh, full marathons. And I don't do it because I always love running. It's because when you put yourself in very difficult situations where you're mentally and physically really drawn out, then when whatever life gives you, you are able to respond because you put yourself already in a simulated situation like that. So Victor, Dr. Victor Franklin was put through the most arduous, most difficult situation ever he could have imagined. But what this did was prepare him for other life challenges that lay ahead of him. And he was able to cope because he knew he's gone through the worst. I mean, if you ask any athlete, right, you ask them, okay, how do you prepare for your games? They will say, I practice so much more at my practice sessions, at my training. So the game, I just have to do what happens in the game is nothing because I put myself through hell before that. And, and that is what, the, what Victor Franklin talks about as well putting himself through the most difficult situation, which was the concentration camps. Of course, he didn't do it on purpose. This happened to him. But what this did was it prepared him for whatever life gave for him or served for him later on in life as well. And, he, and, and he's prepared for it. So my only um, interpretation and advice at the end of the book for anybody who would read it is, at the end of it, you are actually preparing yourself for life. And don't get... And I, I know certain challenges are difficult for you. You don't want to get into certain tasks which go outside your comfort zone. But when you put yourself through those challenges, you are preparing yourself for life. Because if, because if you live in your comfort zone, you will not be able to handle things like debt, things like financial trouble, things like you know um, uh, different personal or professional challenges. You won't be able to cope. But if you put yourself in those situations on a daily basis, you will be more ready to cope. And, and, and that is what uh, it basically looks at. Hope that made a bit of sense as well. It did. It did. Uh, indeed. Um, if I can totally relate to it now. If we, now, when we take an infant, uh, they keep crying, saying they can't turn, and then they struggle to call and then walk. So we also have gone through the same, right? So in that same incident, if we put the current situation, we might go through time uh, during a relationship uh, or maybe at work or in uh, like overall financial or economical uh, status uh, overall we always keep complaining and the health situation uh, uh, past a few or a couple of uh, years that we all are going through uh, we always on complaining saying that we are not ready for this but at some point we need to get ready right so it's really made uh, sense mass like um, it's a good uh, learning as well from the book i hope uh, many of us have got a clear idea of what the author is trying to tell all of us uh, in that book having said that let's move on to the next question from uh, you know uh, can you explain how author has given insights how a mother is trying to for the best yeah that's quite interesting i will uh, <laughs> first go with this because we all know that uh, when we are small uh, the how mothers are trying to get things i mean the even they scold us or like hit us or something but when we are when we get younger uh, she can't do that so the weapon she uses emotional blackmailing <laughs> if I'm correct. So at this book also, there were so many instances that she uses that because at one stage, uh, the all the uh, siblings were staying in one room in uh, Seoul, uh, their youngest brother's house. And at one night, uh, the eldest daughter was hitting uh, the eldest uh, brother by mistake. And when he, when he scolded her, uh, in the morning, what she did was she packed everything and she went home. And what then mother took her again to his uh, her brother, and she was telling that you should apologize your brother, and you you just can't walk out like this because your brother has scolded you. He's like a father to you. You should obey him. 
so this uh, actually this is this is about the uh, author uh, writer daughter so she refused to apologize and she's not doing that so at that time what mother was saying like uh, this child is ignoring me because i don't have anything and have no ed education so this uh, the daughter gets very upset and she tells her that no that's not the reason mother she tells that and at that time she apologizes his brother and when the book goes on it says that uh, there after her mother's disappearances uh, when certain something similar happens she always tells to the to the other person i'm sorry it's my mistake uh, please forgive me so she was uh, i mean park sonia was trying to uh, uh, keep their children in a correct track and at the same time when her youngest daughter uh, moved from uh, usa and trying to uh, settle in seoul she was given uh, giving her a, a persimmon tree which the daughter was refused to take she said no mother it's not useful so i don't want to take this then what she tells was like uh, so uh, it's so when i die you can pick persimmons and think about me so she felt guilt and she said okay mother i will take this and go likewise and at the same time uh, there were some moments uh, there were one moment that uh, park sonyo's brother in law uh, wanted to go to school but they couldn't uh, afford to uh, do that because uh, they didn't have much money but she she was fighting fighting with her husband and her sister in law but she couldn't do that and at the same time that happened to her young uh, eldest daughter also but she used to fight with her husband and she was able to uh, uh, help her, help her daughter to go to school so uh, that's how and there were one moment uh, there's one thing also that uh, she was uh, uh, when she was going to a church uh, she was uh, seeing a, a lady with a mink coat and she thereafter she was uh, she was telling her daughter uh, i want a mink coat and she was asking why mother no i want a mink coat then uh, she was telling that okay then come to see all we'll go shopping together and she noticed that whenever she, uh, her daughter goes to the uh, shop uh, she was uh, looking at the amount i mean the price tag and after she got the uh, mink coat uh, they came to their uh, their uh, her uh, elder son's uh, home and at there her daughter-in-law was saying oh my god you're so lucky you have a daughter who brought you mink coats uh then only she realizes that uh, there should be something wrong and she wins to the she goes to a, a shop and asks for the price she got a shock of her life because she never thought that this would uh, cost that much so she was telling her daughter that okay uh, we will love it i don't want this we will return this then what her daughter was saying like no mother you have all the right to wear this uh, uh coat i mean so that's how we all know that uh, how thoughtful of our mothers and even though they are trying to do everything for the not because of her for the betterment of her family so that that's how it goes uh, hamsu no ka and that uh, sentimental uh, blackmail i can relate to it and we do it as well um saying are you just you're ignoring me because i'm here at home doing nothing and things like that we you do every day we hear it from our moms right uh, so it's really a thoughtful and an emotional uh, sort of a book that i feel and we are all going through the same scenario and um, uh, we are com we are coming to the end of our session uh, with that note we'll conclude the session by taking the getting the key take away from the books from both the presenters let's start with inoka can you give us one key take away from the book to the audience uh you want to go with me right yeah let's have it hear it from you right okay uh actually uh the as i informed you earlier the what really stuck me uh about this book is uh at the end of the book the writer daughter goes to uh 
uh, Rome and at the uh, Basilica Church, she was looking at the Piace where Holy Mother was holding her son. And at the same time, uh, she was purchasing a, a rosary. Then she records a memory that her mother was telling her, whenever you, you go to the smallest country in the world, please take me a, a please buy me a rosewood rosary. So when she purchased it, the nun was asking her, uh, is this a gift to someone? Then she was thinking, will I be able to give this to my mother? I mean, that part, it really touched me. And so at that moment, I made a promise to myself that when it comes to my mother, I will never ever have that, uh, I will never ever let that uh, guilt feeling into my heart and I will avoid all the what ifs. I mean, we all know that, I mean, our parents won't ask so many things from us. All they ask from us is some kind of love and attention. So I'm requesting all of the audience today, just take a post from your busy life and go to your mother or go to your wife and say that how much she means to you and how much you love her. And the sparkle that you see, you can see in her eyes, it's priceless and it's amazing. That's it, Hamzu. Thank you. Go to our loved ones, rush to our loved ones and how how much you mean to us, right? And uh, Mars, if you can give us the key takeaway from the book. Sure. So, um, on a, yeah. So on, on a concluding note, um, you know, humans have been around for a couple of million years. We were built to survive, not to succeed. So whenever things get outside our comfort zone, we want to escape. We don't like it because it, things get uncomfortable. So when, I mean, back in the day, you know, when there were saber two tigers, we used to run away because we don't, we want to go for our safety, right? But in life, if you want to really become successful, you need to put yourselves in those difficult situations. You don't shy away from it. It is easier, it's more comfortable to say, no, not today. I'm not going to do this today. It's too difficult. I'm not going to try this new um, position out at office because it might be over my ability. But unless we put ourselves into these difficult situations, we will never know what we are capable of. And trust me, the human body and mind is capable of a lot of amazing things. But we will never know that if we don't put ourselves through those difficult situations, put ourselves through those challenges and see exactly how far we can go. And believe me, you will surprise yourself uh, because we are capable of so much more than we can ever imagine. But very often we go through our whole life without ever putting us to the test. And, and that is my perspective and my final note of the book as well. Thank you so much for that wonderful and thoughtful uh, lesson for us as well. Maz and we are yet uh, like we are come to the conclusion of today's session and I personally learned a lot of things from both the books and I hope you did too as well. Thank you so much once again our wonderful Chris, Miss Inoka and uh, Maz. You did really a great job and I personally learned a lot of lessons and quickly soon after this rush and say how i mean how i start missing her soon after i moved to um when i started my own family and um, yes i'm going to not uh, give up on the difficult situation uh, i'm personally going through a difficult situation or maybe somebody is going through and i'm going to motivate them as well and these two books are really an awesome like really good books and i learned a lot Hope you did as well. Have a wonderful uh, night, everyone, and see you all on another wonderful session. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>